fucking nineteen-year-old kids. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. All right. All right, we're back in session. Uh, Wes, our emergency manager, for discussion. Okay, we've got uh, Tyre here with Auto Department of Lands to talk about some, some mitigation projects. And, and I know that's one of the things we've been bouncing back and forth, so I'm just going to turn it all over to him and let him introduce himself. Good morning, uh, Tyre Hofeltz with Idaho Department of Lands. I am the Wildfire Risk Mitigation Program Manager for the state of Idaho. I'm based out of our Coeur d'Alene staff office um, and have the pleasure of working with counties and communities and cities and HOAs and nonprofits all over the state of Idaho. So, thank you for uh, letting me spend a little time to visit with you all today. Uh, it's worth a moment to talk about some background uh, for those who may not be familiar with the fire risk mitigation program that Idaho Department of Lands administers. In 2001, the Healthy Forest Restoration Act was passed, and at that point in time, there were dollars that were allocated for the implementation of mitigation projects as well as a bunch of planning and education endeavors to be undertaken as part of that. At that point in time, there wasn't a way to distribute the money down to the ground and so it was determined that the most effective way to get that money to the ground would be through the state forestry organizations hence the reason you're engaging with me today uh, the state forester craig foss is the current representative for the state of idaho uh, as the state forester uh, the mitigation projects across the state cover approximately 27 cooperators and 56 projects to the tune of $17.5 million here in the state of Idaho currently. Of those projects, several of them are currently happening right here in Bannock County. We have two projects that were previously completed by the Portland Soil Water Conservation District in the Cottonwood area and in the Downey area uh, and Lava, Lava Hot Lava Springs or Lava, I don't remember. What Lava Hot Springs. Yeah, it, it's not actually Lava Hot Springs. It's a development that's further to the west and south of Lava in there. So uh, some great work has already been implemented there. And we're also working with the city uh, of Pocatello for the implementation of work on their open space. So in the, uh, the east bench and on the west bench, the so project work in both of those locations. This builds on work that started here in the county in 2003 down at the south end of the county as well with some chipping endeavors. Also at that point in time, a chipper was obtained by the county and administered through the fire department, ultimately being passed over to uh, the Parks and Recs group um, as part of the county. That program lapsed because the funding that was supporting it through the Bureau of Land Management went away basically. So the RCNDs folded their shops as well because of funding issues associated with sponsorships from the Forest Service. And now all of the projects and implementations are funneled through my programs. So today I wanna to talk about a couple of projects that were sought and funded through the Portland Soil Water Conservation District, but because of, uh, of issues that they've run into, they have asked that I present to you all for determination if appropriate, if you're willing to take these projects on and work with them to the implementation of these, these projects. Uh, the first project I wanna talk about is expansion of work in the Cottonwood Valley area. So this is in the Swan Lake area. This is a $240,000 project, which expands upon previously completed work in the Cottonwood Basin area. So that work previously completed was primarily along the road system within the Cottonwood uh, Grazing Association area for the mitigation of fuels along that road system to create more or less a living or green fuel break along that road system. So mastication and mowing and some planting of green vegetation occurred in there. Uh, we also did some uh, 
a few ridge lines worth of work in there to remove conifer encroachment inside of aspen stands because aspen is a really really good fire break uh, vegetative element that has a tendency not to burn so the intention of this work is to continue to expand that work onto already pre-identified road infrastructure as well as identified uh, ridge lines to continue to compartmentalize the landscape so that if a fire occurs in there that the fire responders that uh, are on incident there will have places that they can either burn off of or defend from or expand upon through the utilization of these fire breaks. The other project that I'd like to talk about is in the Smith Gulch area or just south of here in the Income area. Again, this is another $240,000 project, which is to reduce and remove juniper encroachment into the sagebrush areas, as well as additional work on ridge lines and uh, mitigation work along uh, road infrastructure that's in there. So two tracks as well as <coughs> the, uh, the hard pack that's in there. The intention of this work is to reduce the severity of fires that will occur in there. So by removing the larger vegetative elements of the pro of the, um, com <coughs> of the ecological community component in there will reduce the impact on the soils as well as the other elements that are found in the landscape. Uh, we, we often find that environments that are uh, overrun by uh, juniper encroachment <coughs> have a very long recovery period, but those that were able to mitigate and are primarily sagebrush, that their recovery is much, much shorter, and we're able to address some of the other ecological needs, like cheatgrass, much more rapidly uh, because of the response of the existing native vegetation that's in there. So to that end, talk about how the program functions. Uh, it is through an agreement with Idaho Department of Lands. It is under a memorandum of understanding uh, that we would enter into with the county if you so chose to take these projects on. There would be two agreements because the project areas are different from each other and the budgeting items may frankly be different from each other as well. The program is on a reimbursement basis only. So that means that the county pays for the work completed and then the state reimburses the county for that work. Generally speaking, it's about a 20 to 25 day turnaround time once a reimbursement is sought through the state for those monies to be renumerated back to our local cooperators. So it's actually a really short window uh, that we turn those around for. One of these grants, the Cottonwood Valley Restoration does require match. It is 10%. So we'd be looking for $24,000 of match to be accompanying the project work. That's not necessarily dollars that have to go on the ground. That could be this meeting, frankly. It could be landowner engagement in the process. It could be firewood collection. It could be the grazing that the landowners do on the land in order to maintain or reduce the vegetation out there. So it's not a cash match requirement. It's an in-kind match requirement associated with the grant dollars. All that we ask is that on the reimbursement paperwork, when those uh, reimbursements are sought, that that documentation is provided about what that match is uh, to us so that we can provide as part of our documentation package uh, for our fiscal folks. Uh, the projects will be available for expenditure until 2025, November of 2025. So we have a lot of work seasons still in front of us to be able to expend these grant dollars. Uh, and then there are a couple of reporting requirements. We have a GIS database that we do ask our cooperators to enter the reportables of the accomplishments that have been completed as part of the project that are tied with the reimbursements. So when accomplishments are completed and reimbursements sought, those are married together on my end with my fiscal people and we're able to complete a, com uh, a whole financial package that we are then responsible to provide to the Forest Service because we are on a reimbursement basis only as well with the Forest Service. So these aren't dollars that sit in some bank account that we're drawing from. You seek reimbursement from us, we pay you, and then we seek reimbursement from the Forest Service. So that's how the program functionally works. Um, so what 
I've given you a 10,000 foot overview to hopefully spark some discussion and questions. What can I answer for you all? First of all, I've been, I don't know about Ernie, but I should probably just ask him, but I've never heard it called Smith Gulch. Orient me to the map of where Smith Gulch area would be. Just uh, tell me by directions. Would be, or, I mean, it's just out of Income on Portnet Road. That's what I thought. About a mile and a half out of Income on Portnet Road, close public television. Straight across North side, south side. South side. South side across from Black Rock? Right behind Tuck Smith. Yep. Okay. What about the, the Cottonwood one down in Swan Lake area? It's literally hang a left at the Swan Lake uh, mm. granary there. At the mark? Across the church. And go up to, go up to church up towards uh, yeah. what's his name's house at the very top. Um, Steve Smith. Yeah, okay. They did a bunch of mulching around the other side of Steve Smith's on uh, Mont Henderson's. Mont Henderson, that's who I was asking for. Okay, all right. Henderson and Scott Henderson. I'm good. Now, just, uh, you know, everybody asks. I'd like to know where I'm talking about. The Cottonwood Project is Cottonwood Cattle Association. Okay. It's state, ground, and private. Okay. <coughs> so administration fees. <coughs> is that part of the match? It could be. Uh, the grant can also pay for administrative fees as well. Uh, you can collect indirect as part of your budgeting in the grants as well. So if you have a negotiated rate with the federal entity, you can apply that. Otherwise, it's a de minimis rate or 10% of expenditures. And there's a formula that's actually associated with that. So it's up to the first 25,000 per contractor. And that's by design through the Office of Management and Budget, which is a federal agency that dictates the policies associated with all kinds of federal things. And this is just one of those things that they dictate on. So. 10% of all administrative cost, and then up to the first 25,000 per contract vendor can be collected, or $2,500 is what it boils down to. Yeah, so and, the, and the Smith Gulch, is, it's just straight, there's no match on it. No match, okay. nope. Its requirement is that it has to be adjacent to federal projects. So in that particular instance, the BLM has done some work and is planning on doing some additional work, which then ties into the Forest Service, which is right in the front end of implementing a bunch of work clear up on top. So we're looking at a project that basically will go from the interstate all the way to the top of the drainage system. So just some other quick things. How many other counties actually participate in this? Through the, the state, state of Idaho. Through the state of Idaho, I currently have 17 counties that are participating in this program. Okay, so there's counties that are doing it. Because it's one thing yes. that I don't like getting involved in is counties doing functions when other organizations can do functions. Yep. So they happen to be the fiscal agents uh, that are able to take on the projects, and that's why they're participating, is because most of the local cooperators don't have the financial means to function in a reimbursement basis program. And then uh, because you said this is coming from federal funds into state funds and coming down, is there bid requirements, procurement requirements, wage requirements that have to be done at the federal level? Like Davis-Bacon wages or other things that way? Yes, so all of those requirements are passed through in the agreement, which are part of the state procurement policies, which are also part of the agreement. So basically, we can't be any less restrictive than the federal procurement process, and we can't be any less restrictive than the state procurement process. So we have to follow the federal procurement process and bid process for this? With, no, so we're bound. So our state procurement processes are actually more restrictive than the federal ones are. So we have to you abide see. by those. Okay. Yeah. Which you're likely already as a county abiding by. So it's a $100,000 threshold. Uh, and for administrative contracts, it's, uh, I, you'll have to forgive me, I forget the citation within the state code, which allows <coughs> for a non-competitive bidding process for the administrative. For administrative portion. professional yeah. services. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Christy, concerns? Can we get a copy of the application? So of course. we can see all of the requirements that we're going to need to follow up on. This will throw us as part of a, this will add to our single audit requirement. Most likely we're going to be over that anyways due to ARPA funds, but this could be a major fund that would be audited as part of that. So that may increase our audit, audit. costs. 
what is administrative fee that's allowed to be tacked in? Because most grants are either uh, uh, five, seven, eight, or ten percent. So we don't actually limit it because we don't want to dictate to the cooperator what that would be. Because frankly, there may be a project that's 75 or 80 miles from the particular home unit of the organization and it just costs a lot more to go <coughs> to those versus those that are right here in your back door so we typically see it range from 12 to 18 percent on most of our grants okay talk to me about the gis database what, what does that look like does that entail like someone from the staff to go out take pictures so you get the gis location on that or what are you looking for there so the gis data is information about the work the footprint of the work that was done on the ground uh, so oftentimes what we're looking for is somebody to take a gps unit to walk the edge of the, the treatment location to create a polygon that can then be uploaded into our system. And the system is a drop-down selection. So you select who you are, the funding year, the funding type, the type of treatment that you did. So was it education, mitigation, or planning? And within those subsets are about 25 or so different selection items that you can choose from. For the type of work that we're talking here, it's mastication primarily. There might be some hand work, but primarily it's mastication work. Select that and then the number of treated acres and select the unit size, so acres or square feet. That's pretty straightforward. Pretty easy for GIS. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is similar to the project <coughs> years and years ago Bannock County did it's some hazard mitigation work. Um, if you have a precise I mean, we're talking probably 2000-ish, mm -hmm. early 2000s. Um, is this the same? This is, yeah, that okay. Okay. that program was funded largely by the Bureau of Land Management. Okay. So there were a few pittance of pennies that flowed to the eastern Idaho area, but at that point in time, there were so many dollars that were coming through both federal organizations that at a state level, the, the state fire working group decided they would decide, they divided the state in half. So basically everything north of the Salmon River Forest Service funds would be used north of the Salmon River and everything south of the Salmon River, BLM dollars would be used. The BLM, as I mentioned, has dried up, hence the reason we've expanded the IDL programs across the entire state now. So you've got these two projects ready here. Do you have a for future projects identified as well or where do the projects come from? So these projects came from Portland Soil Water Conservation District because of interest that the grazing associations have expressed for the implementation of additional work. Uh, that has to do in part from meetings with the county emergency manager and the fire working group as they worked through their hazard mitigation plan update, which updated the county wildfire protection plan as well, which is a required planning document that was uh, built into the hazard or into the Healthy Forest Restoration Act in 2001. So as part of that planning effort, we've now identified several additional projects that have high potential for funding. We just need somebody to apply for them. And we're actually in the open application period right now, and it will be open until the 4th of February. So the other question is, is it, uh, this can be used not just for grazing, can it be used for reduction of fuels in uh, urban wildlife interface areas? We have yes. a lot of areas, we have people encroaching into wildlife areas and we have houses being built in areas that probably shouldn't have been built in without having a you know good swath around the house so it doesn't catch on fire yep so the intent of the dollars is to protect human life infrastructure and natural systems in that order and so as we look to establish what these projects are and where they're at, yes, the utilization of these dollars is appropriately applied within the wildland urban interface, and it's this ever expanding area. When you get, when there's projects that are made, do you have to have like uh, uh, when you're talking about like slope stability due to removal of vegetation? I mean, what, are you guys looking at like we got a couple areas that have a tendency to have a little bit of a hill to them, and if we go take out a bunch of trees, I'm afraid that we might get some some movement, a little bit of water. Sure. Are we, is there requirements to have those actually looked at before we submit those or what's the? No, before they are submitted, it is not a requirement, but as part of the project implementation, as part of my program of work that I provide technical, I'm a technical service provider to all the cooperators. And so 
I open every project that happens within the state of Idaho okay. and evaluate the work and determine whether or not there are other elements that need to be brought into consideration before the project is implemented. And definitely soils, wildlife, water quality, all of those considerations are brought into the decision. Okay. Wes, what's your capacity to handle this <coughs> stuff? I saw your board yesterday and it was a full board. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's provisions within these these two grants that we can bring somebody in as a project manager to actually go down through and uh, facilitate the function and the reporting requirements as well. Yep. Is that correct, Tyre? Yes, most definitely. Importnif has uh, offered that they would be willing to continue in that administrative capacity. They're just not financially able to take on the reimbursements moving forward. That's their particular problem um, at the moment. I would ask, Mr. Clark, do you have the staff available in auditing and Christy in your guys' office that can, I mean, if we start throwing more grant stuff in. Right. I need to look at the application. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, step one is the application. That's what I was thinking also. And then um, it depends on next week's interviews. <laughs> it's been kind of a running joke. We, we can't seem to get anybody hired that uh, every time we make an offer, somebody else offers to pay them more and so I don't want to throw this into the clerk's office and the auditing office and mm -hmm. have you completely overwhelmed. But at the same time, I think there's so we an are, opportunity. We are trying here. a couple of different things, um, interns and then hiring and different things to try to get more help in there because it is busy. They are. Yep. So as part of, if I may interject, as part of what Portneuf can provide to you all is that administrative support and then it literally becomes just a review by your offices before submission instead of the compilation of all the necessary paperwork for submission as part of the program of work in there. And the application in and of itself is a draft of what's going to be completed because we know from the time of submission to the time of implementation there are always changes that happen and so you are not bound by what is in the application. Literally the application serves as a way to receive funding and then we will figure out how much to do, what to do, and where to do it from there. And that's a negotiated process. Okay. So when you're saying port, if you're meaning port of soil and water? Yes. Okay. Mr. Coster, any comments? Thank you. What we found out <coughs> in the past projects is on a reimbursement basis, we don't have the capital. <coughs> have investigated on at several levels the possibility of establishing a line of credit, short-term loan to make this reimbursable portion work. The Attorney General has told us that since it is not addressed in Idaho Code, it is assumed we cannot obtain a line of credit for our loan. With the scope of work that's coming up, we don't have the district funds to reimburse the contractor and wait for the 25 days to to receive funding back. We still have to keep our lights on too. So what we are proposing is that Bannock County would serve, for want of a better term, as the banker. We would we already have a project manager. It's on a contract basis that's taking care of the Nine Mile Brush Creek project right now. We can do the administrative portion. We'd make sure the invoices are correct, the maps are correct, and then we would submit that invoice to your folks for review and to file the reimbursement. The county would be responsible for the contracting with the contract to the work as well as the landowners. And we, we would like to partner with the county to, and of course all this is, is up for negotiation, but we would like to partner with the county to keep these projects moving forward. They have a tremendous amount of value, but currently we just can't handle the funding and we can't find another funding source. So you would charge the county for administration fees? We would either split the indirect costs with the county or the county could reimburse us on an hourly basis depending on the amount of work that's required. 
And you both can take administrative fees. But we we can share the administrative fees. Uh, we could we could bill you uh, for our costs and make that so you could be totally reimbursed and then just pay us for the work. You know whatever whatever type of system we can come up with would make this thing work. I can give you an example if you would okay. like. Uh, that's right here in your area. So Bonneville County, which is a very similar entity uh, in size as far as population base is, as Bennett County is, their emergency manager has hired an administrative contractor in order to implement and engage with all of the landowners from the development of the prescriptions to the collection of the uh, remunerations from the contractors and creating the, the packets of information back to the county who then review and supply those back to IDL. They take a very small percentage of administrative, so like 2% for the county, and then for their administrative contractor, it's 16, 50, it's 15 and a half percent is what it is that they're taking from the grant. So in total, we're looking at 17 and a half percent of administrative fees. Plus, they're also collecting indirect on it as well that can be applied to those things that we can't explicitly define as deliverables. You know, the piece of paper that we use, the pen that we write with, the chair that we sit in, those things are all collected into the county coffers for use as you deem appropriate. Okay. Well, I'll tell you where I'm at right now. I, I'm, I agree with Christy and, and just, or Jason here. I think that we need to get the paperwork so we know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, Terrell always says the 95% baked deal. I think we're, we're not at that point right now. I'd, I'd like to talk to the West a little more and, and well, I'd like to see some some proposed policy and procedure of how how we do this making sure that we're going within the bid process even though you have a project manager um, there might be some requirements um, because if we start having the same manager managing multiple projects then all of a sudden we've stacked in and we may be looking at a comp total contract that that would have to go to bid as well because if you start talking about hey we've got we've got 15 projects I'm just hypothetically speaking here we are outside then of the just the professional services line item because all of a sudden that contract is worth a I mean if it's a $250,000 contract and it's 17% that's $42,500 right there and if you have two or three others then you just blew the we need to go out to bid for that then and so there's some things that we need to have some understanding of how does that work or do we just hire that person internal and let that person do it there's some things that way because it I mean, what do, what are we looking at? What are we doing? We have a grants manager, uh, people. How does that work? But those are some of the things that I want to. I think we need to just tease out a little bit better. Um, I, I think it's a, I think it's a good project or a, a good program, and I don't necessarily have a problem participating in it. Um, I think it's just we just need to, we just need to cook it out a little bit more to make sure that we know exactly, and as we say in military task subordinates, everybody knows exactly what they're doing before we say go do it, and we haven't figured that out. What's your time frame for needing an answer from us? Uh, preferably before April of this coming year. Oh, that'd be a lot quicker. No, I, was, I was thinking no, like no. middle of January we'd have this yeah, figured out. Preferably before April. That way it gives you enough time if you opt to take on <coughs> the projects to go through your bidding processes because you want to be able to start work more or less as soon as the ground is available to work on because if we end up in a drought situation again then your work season gets really narrowed so just a question on that do you do you guys prefer RFP or RFQ do you want request for qualifications or request for proposal on these projects it does not matter to us you don't care how we do it no nope. okay whichever you all deem as appropriate and frankly you could do um, a three bid so the state system allows for a three bid phone quote system. It's a, if it's under a hundred thousand dollars as well. Yeah. But your your internal processes may not allow that. But at least it at doesn't. the state level, it allows that. So. Okay. Shanda, do you have any concerns from what we've been talking about, the bidding process or any of it? Not concerns. Just a glance to be involved, and then as Christine was with the application, right? We'll know more about what those bids need to be moving forward from there, and we know the dollar amounts and things like that. Okay. And I can give you all some points of contacts in other counties for commissioners that you could specifically 
talk to about yeah. how they've created well, I'll, programs. I'll, 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 I'll probably be calling them this afternoon and we'll be talking about <laughs> that. So, <laughs> Wes? No, I think we're, we're going in the right direction and these mitigation activities is the things that we need to take a look at for future uh, involvement and anything that we could do to minimize and lessen the impact not only to the, the community at large as well as our response entities. I'm all for it. So I think once we take a look at the paperwork and we brainstorm a little more, we can, we can go from there. I think that the cherry on this cake is that it's bringing a lot of money into your community. So right now, with the two projects that are ongoing in Bannock County plus the two that are proposed, you're looking at just a little under a million dollars that's yeah. coming into the, into the county. So I think that's a great incentive in and of itself. Yeah. If I might interject, uh, with the project manager, this is not a full-time position. Understood. Currently, uh, we have a project manager under contract the contractor sends him a GIS map every night on what amount of work has been done, where it's been done, the acres. The project manager makes an on-site visit once a week, mm -hmm. and he makes sure the mapping is correct, and the project is proceeding as outlined in the scope of work. So it's. It won't require a full-time employee, and the project manager we currently have is Stephen Smith, and uh, he's doing this on a contract basis. And so is so is he like a PMP? Is he a uh, project management professional? Is certified? Just went through all this stuff? No. I mean, or is this just we said, hey, somebody go out and do this, and that's the whole uh, other thing too that I'm talking about is we start running projects. And, and this is where I start coming back as a county when we start putting the county name on things we, we go through requests for qualifications then because there's projects and things that we have other things that we can be working on in the county that if we have a PMP that's in-house I would rather use a our in-house person to do that and go out and verify that that project is correct and that we meet the standard of the county instead of just hey we're gonna know you know I'm not saying that that guy's not qualified but I mean you know some of the projects that I see being run and some of the I mean wow you're running 15 percent for some of that stuff I, I'm in the wrong business man I need to I need to go run some projects and that's what I'm saying is, is we need to have a conversation about this and see where we're going to be the best financial stewards of the county and state tax dollars well and I think as this process were to move along we could clearly define what the roles of that project manager were and are moving forward uh, currently, we there, there we could not find any guidelines of you know what experience uh, this man has been involved in uh, as a contractor, a farmer. So it is. All right, thank you. So, how soon can you have that paperwork to to us? You send me an email, and if there's a Wi-Fi in this building, I'll send it. Okay, if you that and after we get that information I'd like to set something up Christy the first of January that we can review other Christy he was looking at you and pointing at her yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was really confused there too I, 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 was like, I saw the finger I saw the finger and I saw him look at like and Christy's right <laughs> down there our chief staff not here right now so Christy's right here and, and I'd just like to to get us there in the first of January so that we move forward get back on it pretty yep. good place. Yep. Okay. Yeah. If there's anything that I can answer in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right. Thank, All right. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. Tori? talk about today is we uh, submitted uh, on the FEMA grant portion for this mobile morgue expan uh, expansion trailer so FEMA came back with an email and basically what they did is they outlined the fact that these funds are given 
during a disaster period. And then the equipment that we buy, depending on the equipment, which is trailer meets um, this guideline to where they want to look at the depreciation value and then they'll invest in 75% of that depreciation rate, which ultimately comes out to be about 30285 34 That's what FEMA is willing to cover, which is less than we originally anticipated. What was the overall total, cost? Total cost was $65,000. Um, on their, all the information online, everything that way said that they were not pay less than 75%. Um, and then upon this email, I called back and I spoke with the gentleman and he said, well, unfortunately this information <coughs> is not listed. He said, we just decided to do this. Leave it so to the federal government, man. Yeah. Got so on. I said, okay, well then, you know, break it down for me. Uh, one of the biggest things that he did point out is this is money that's allotted over the disaster period. So he mentioned, had you guys applied sooner, then we could give you more money, which also goes to the point of the longer we wait, the less they'll be able to contribute because of the depreciation. <laughs> so the conversation really is mostly to bring you guys up to speed and to talk about other possible revenue avenues or revenue but uh funds funding well, sources funding opportunities what's the total yes. cost on the trailer sixty five thousand dollars was oh, the, that's total the total cost, cost of just yes. the trailer okay Thank you. so the new county amount would be thirty four seven and we originally thought it was going to be like 15. right <laughs> yeah thousand well, I'll just tell you where I'm at right now. While we're talking to ISU and, and talking about <coughs> putting the morgue up there and stuff, I would rather invest funds in that at this time sure. than go forward with the trailer. Sure. Well, and the other thing that we, the morgue is great, but we also have to realize the stretch of interstate, the potential for a mass casualty situation. We still would like to have a mobile opportunity at some point. Well, and depending on the process mm -hmm. of how long that's going to take to actually employ, because our current situation is we have a three bed capacity that's yeah well and and I, I think we need to have a mobile one but the main thing is is we don't have a necessary sure. capital budgetary line item that was put in place sure absolutely. And, and that's where I think that maybe we come back at, at the budget, budget time. at the budget cycle right. because that's something that I have a problem with is, is okay now we're scrambling trying to find and I understand FEMA money is out there I got it um, but at the same time, it's one of those things that I would rather have a budgetary line item that goes through budget process. We know that, hey, we've got $35,000 that's in that line item, or we put a full 65000 in that line item, and if we can get funds to match and mitigate that cost, then we go that way instead of, hey, we're going to rob one of these other funds to try and do that, and then we create a shortfall or just it's, it's not very clear. Of course. The other idea that was thrown out there was to use portion of the ARPA funds to help this, that this would fall within that. Well, it, so. and, and again, it's one of those things we don't really have projects specific put in place. Absolutely. We don't have, you know, and, and again, I, I like having those capital projects that we went through in budgetary cycle. I understand you weren't there at budgetary cycle, completely understood, but I would rather have that discussion at budget. If we're going to use ARPA funds for it, that's fine, but we need to do that in the budgetary cycle. Absolutely. Because we still have ARPA funds there, but we need to make sure that we do that. No, we have a lot of projects we're talking about that are big projects for yeah. ARPA right now. And I'm and I'm 100% fine with that. I just, at this point, this was just to get if, you guys the information and let you know where we're at on this project. So if they would have had kind of prioritize this. If they would have had 75% of the total pay cost, like we were talking about, I was okay with that. But when you come back now and we have to go back into it, I, I just, that I don't, I don't like touching budgets that much no I, mean, I understand that and that's like I say this is a big information for you guys I want you guys to understand where we're at because like I said this information was not there before which is you know kind of depressing the fact that they didn't have all of the information because we tried to go through the diligence of making sure we had every aspect of this covered but now where there was new information, that's why it was important to at least give yeah. you guys the same information. So you need a better microscope, huh? Progress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Magnifying glass. That's yeah. the learn on grant applications, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's the federal government, and they can change those grants a lot of times without necessarily notifying you. Until it's up and awarded, they can change those amounts. That's why um, um, 
you know, again, let's go into the budgetary cycle, and if we choose to use ARP at that time, then let's identify and go through that. The other thing, too, is they may or may not still have FEMA dollars available at that time, and they're um, there's still those two acts that are in the one that's in Congress right now. Still sitting on the desk. Um, what's going to happen is even FEMA and some of these federal agencies are going to have to are going to have to release the the monies faster because they're not spending them fast enough. Sure. And so when they do that, they don't want to turn the money back to the federal government. So what's going to happen is sooner or later they're going to have to say, hey, Options. whoever there's has projects, they might open more. And so you might actually get the full seventy dollars. Sure. Okay. So. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Brian. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good. I'm Brian Tilly, president of the Body of Christ Church, and this is Stacy Van Kirk. Van Kirk. He's the treasurer. Secretary. Oh, secretary. Secretary Treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack welcome. Of, Jack of all trades. Know, yeah, right? exactly. Chairman, Stacy, what was your last name? Van Kirk. So we'd like to request a cancellation of the property taxes on our building under, I believe it's title 63, section 1302. It would actually be under 63711. So 1352 is if you were constructing. So did you build 1302. it? 1302. Yeah, 13, 1302, any of the 13 section is, is a tax cancellation due to the fact that your property may be used as a nonprofit, but it's currently under construction or may be under construction. Oh, okay. And so, I don't know, were you under construction? No. no. Okay. No. <laughs> so, so, that's where I would say that you'd probably be requesting that. So, if, I think you have everything that we sent in, but uh, somehow our um, form that we filled out last January was lost in the mail. And I did not do my due diligence on on verifying that we got the letter back from the commissioners approving the tax exemption. So that, you know, I will do a better job of that in the future. I'm going to make sure that this all is taken care of. So, but uh, the other issue is so for some reason we did not receive our assessment in June. Um, we never got it. We can't find it. So it's almost like that got lost in the mail too. And everything that we get, I keep. And we have been tax exempt the previous three years, but also we've only had two letters. So <coughs> one of those letters was missing too. I do have the two that we did receive. So I, I do have the, I even have the laptop here that shows the intent of the. the um, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, but this is something that happens every year. Yeah. I mean, so follow-up is is not get the county's responsibility that's yeah. that's that's yours and I've told them we no longer send out the notices and all that other stuff that we used to the county's not going to babysit the way that it had been done in the past I turned to my legal counsel and seek his advice under this section that they just talked about so um, you're bringing up the tax exempt exceptions and that has to be applied to once a year um, and by April 15th so probably the more appropriate section would be under 63711 which would be a cancellation of taxes because of hardship is where they'd have to seek and that'd be discretionary up to the board of county commissioners <coughs> so mr. chairman if I may yes then the hardship being sought then would be due to the fact that it is a nonprofit religious organization that the paying of the taxes would create the undue hardship on the financial feasibility of the religious organization or nonprofit organization. It could be. And so that's for them to present and for you as a commission to decide. Okay. So under the terms of what we're meeting here today, by law, we can't do anything. Okay. It, it, has, it needs to be paid. Uh, we can't go back and because there's a cutoff date and you didn't meet that cutoff date. And we don't have the authority, but under this other section, you do. You could come in and, and apply for a hardship, and then we can talk about that. But under the circumstances of today, we're bound. Okay. Okay. So the the question then would be, um, the application that was made today was under sixty three. 
1302, which, as I looked at it, that was the one that I think that uh, falls under the construction of a miscellaneous provision of tax law, cancellation and refund of property tax, and it talks about. That's the one that I. Yeah, that's one. Or money to to in which may be entitled for reasons of double double payment of property taxes, or which the property the same year, or the double assessment of erroneous assessment, or property through error. Hmm, I wonder if Notwithstanding, that actually, I need to, for them, another issue that we have with that one. Uh, notwithstanding the provision of law in any case in which may a county commission may find due to error or otherwise by fault of the county in excess, county commission also do this uh, the property made official minutes. For some reason, that does not read the same as the section that I printed off the state right. web page. That's what I'm on right now is huh. Idaho Status and Code 63.13.02, mm -hmm. miscellaneous provisions of state tax law. And Mr. Chairman, if I might add, I'm looking at the agenda right now, and it does talk about requesting cancellation of property taxes. So I think notice would be appropriate if the commission wanted to take up under the 70 level term chair. <laughs> so if you think we could time. move on that? Yeah. It's notice of a request of cancellation. It's the yeah. cancellation of what section of code um, you would exercise the authority to do so and remove tax burden that's what we're talking that's the the discussion is is it an undue hardship then for the organization to pay taxes there that section does in that 13 section it's actually uh, further down it talks to the construction part that does talk about of an erroneous error double assessment or erroneous assessment or pro of property through error yeah. so and it's error on the county okay. um, and I think that you would go back to could be a stretch yeah that would be a stretch because there's not a double assessment on the property well if we can consider the hardship then that's probably the way to go at this point in time so well I, did, I don't have a hardship application yeah and we don't have we don't have sure, financials to thing. follow that right. I did include the financials but uh, I can definitely uh, apply for the hardship and fill out the hardship application. So this is this is just that's where I'm at. just no, Commissioner I'm Tubby talking. Yeah. Well, this is this is just me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm I I don't have problems with if people fall under rules and regulations, but it's not the job of us to babysit everybody. Yeah. And I, I don't want that to sound mean or in, but we have lots of these that come through here, and that's where it's the due diligence of the property owners that have to follow through with this. The other thing too is I don't like granting hardships unless there's a hardship that can be shown and we can actually have the rule, the, the stuff that's there. Now, if you guys want to bring that through, I'm okay with hearing it. It's but a I different think, application yeah, from what I have it, here. And I, I would say that I would say at this, that this time, Mr. Chairman, that if they so choose that this discussion, that I don't believe that there would be a decision at this point and we'd give them the opportunity then if they want to bring their financials and come back. That would be a discussion. Fill out a hardship. Fill out the actual full hardship that we have that everybody uses, because then okay. it's we, the we don't we do not give special treatment to to people. Everybody does everything the same. Yeah. And then yeah. and we go from there. Okay. All right. I appreciate it. We'll work through the hardship then. Christy's right behind you, and she would be glad to help you and assist you. And okay. and I'll just tell you for next year. There's some people that they yeah. call and they bug us a lot to make sure that we got it because you know well, it could have gotten so. sent. We'll, we'll hand deliver it. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, no, no, there's as you all know, and you yeah. all know that Pocatello <coughs> Mail has been messed up for over well, a year. I mean, I work well, for the city and all, everything. It goes down. Right? You can mail like to your <laughs> neighbor, and it'll yeah. go down to Salt Lake, and then yeah. come back up to your neighbor. And now it's so. back to work well, and so the other thing too so is, is depending upon what address was put on it, some people are still mailing them to the assessor's office. Some of them they get mailed into the treasurer's office and so it's very easy for I know I use the I use the address that was on the form and I feel yeah that. I so like I said um, yeah, a lot of people hand deliver them yeah and that's we why and, or signature mail for a signature of who signed for it right yeah I will be hand delivering it and asking for a stamp uh, signature on the date that I turn it in from now on with well a copy of that <laughs> so, and, and again for you guys our, it's not that we don't like Churches yeah. and religion, we just follow the rules and we make it fair for everybody, yeah. and we, this is the standard. Yeah, okay. totally understand. So. All right, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Christy, you're up. 
Christine yeah. Davenport, Management Assistant. Last week I brought before you a, pro a proposal um, from Mr. Hashimoto to purchase three properties that were not sold at the tax sale in October. Um, you requested that um, he pay the cost in publication, which was $289.89 per property for a total of $869.67. Mr. Hashimoto has um, shown interest in paying that amount and um, would, if you accept, pay by cashier's check today and I would like, if you accept, to get that to legal to be signed quick claims to be signed on Tuesday. Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the offer from properties not sold at tax sale and move the process forward. We have motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Andrews District. What's that? You need the Andrews District. Mm -hmm. You can convene. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I move that we enter back into the Ambulance District. Come on up. Good morning. Uh, Nick Christensen, Pocatello Fire and Bennett County Ambulance. I am here to request a signature on a, a proposal for a new ambulance. Uh, this is one that we have received a grant for. Um, the total build is going to be 216695 and we have a grant for 140 from Idaho EMS uh, for that. And this is the <coughs> proposal. We made a couple changes versus the last model we got. and. Uh, Finally got the proposal back and like move forward. Okay. okay. Quick question. We'll have delivery before the end of the grant, correct? We hope so. Uh, they've been a little bit loose with uh, the requirements as far as that goes because of the supply chain problems. Uh, we ordered, well, I came before again, we ordered the chassis, I believe it was the end of August, and they said the chassis was nine months out at that point. Because the so grant, will, that's on state fiscal year, correct? 630? I don't know that. Okay. I think Normally it is. Normally those grants are because we've had this problem in the past. Um, and I'm sorry I'm hitting you with this at the meeting because I didn't think about this when we were talking the other day. Um, but that has been a problem in the past. So maybe follow up and double check. Otherwise, I, we do have within the budget funding for this. But I would hate to see the grant. I will opportunity follow away. up with our sales rep today. Well, sure. uh, I know the state because of some of these things I saw something that they were working with, but maybe if we have confirmation just from the state that yes, they will be. Or get an extension. Yeah. On the grant, possibly. Okay. I don't remember what the item was, but I know on last year's state EMS grant, we were behind on we did it. one item and they extended it just by phone call. It was did very common for them this year. So yeah. we'll need the extension in writing. Okay. Okay. Just because, you know. Auditors this like person, that. <laughs> this person might say it, but then they won't follow through. But um, else when you get your proposed yeah. date, maybe Christine just communicate with the state like as far as grant goes. But if you keep me in the loop, then um, that way I can let Michelle know and we could just make sure that everything's good to go. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would move to uh, approve signature, an authorized signature on the uh, 2022. Um, grant application for an ambulance is presented. We have a motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. If you want this now? That'd be great. Go through Christy. I don't know. The other Christy. Christy? The yeah. other Christy. <laughs> <laughs> what she'll need. I'll, I'll give it to Braden and he can yep. walk down with you. That's it, isn't it? We can. With that yeah. being said, we are adjourned. All right. Did you have something else, Wes?